John, John chapter number 21. Actually, John chapter number 20. We'll be looking at John 21 today. <coughs> I'm just going to do a very brief review to kind of bring us to where we are without being so repetitious that we don't make a lot of headway. But in verse number 19, the Bible says that the same day, the day after Jesus, the, the day that Jesus had showed himself to Mary Magdalene and had given a message to her to go and tell the disciples that she had seen him. And uh, uh, we talked last week about that part where he said, don't touch me for I'm not yet ascended to my father. Uh, a little bit about that. Two different ideas. One of not holding on to him. The other that there could have been that ascension uh, by the time he displayed himself to Thomas. He gave Thomas the liberty to be able to touch him in, in his hands and in his thigh. And the Bible says that, he, that, that that evening that he came and he showed himself to the disciples, they were assembled together because of the fear for the Jews. The Jews were very, uh, there was a lot of animosity going on. There was a lot of hatred. Uh, they had crucified Jesus. They were worried, what would they do to annihilate, annihilate the gospel that Jesus Christ had given them, so they got rid of Jesus, but would they get rid of his disciples and followers? So Jesus comes in and displays himself to them, presents himself to them, and he speaks to them and tells them not to be afraid. He says, peace, fear not. And uh, uh, he showed them, the Bible says, his hands and his side. And the, the disciples, the Bible says they were glad when they saw the Lord. Amen. It is a joyful reaction when we get to see the Lord. Amen. When he displays and shows himself to us. And uh, he said to them a second time, peace. I'll talk more about that in a few moments. He says peace to them. And uh, then he breathes on them. We were talking about uh, making a correlation to the book of Genesis when God breathes into uh, the nostrils of Adam alive. Interesting enough, uh, when God breathes in life, he brings us into being. And uh, aren't you glad for the Spirit of God that breathes into a dead soul life? Amen. That's the breathing of the Holy, Holy Ghost. And uh, I, I love that old song. We don't sing it as much anymore. But let Him breathe on me. Let Him breathe on me. Let the breath of God now breathe on me. There's something to be said about the breath of God breathing on us. And He told them to receive the, uh, the, the, the Holy Ghost. And uh, he said, whosoever sins you remit, um, he said, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are re retained. Now, Je God, Jesus doesn't give them power to forgive sin. The only uh, power to forgive sin is in God. But he does breathe on them the responsibility that they are to preach the sacrificial work of the cross and uh, that is what is to be preached to them that believe. That there's forgiveness in the cross. That there's remittance of sin in the cross. It's all about the cross. Amen. And uh, so he gives them that commission. And he said, whosoever uh, sins uh, you retain, they are retained. If, if they don't accept the message that is preached, then they retain their sins. They can't believe, but you have a responsibility to tell them that it's more than believing, but they need to have the atoning, sacrificial work of the cross happen in their life. There's something great happening here. Amen. And there's a responsibility. But when God breathes on us, we are now commissioned to preach the work of the cross. Really. That's why we need revival services. That's why we need the move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because we need to know that we have a responsibility to preach the sacrificial work of the cross. However, when he was here, Thomas wasn't present. We don't know where he was. 
we don't need to know those details, but what we do know is that uh, Thomas wasn't present. Verse number 24 or 25, would someone read that of chapter number 20? And he says, peace. 
And then he does something else. There is a responsibility that when we have a relationship with God, that when we trust and we believe in him and we have an encounter and the work of the cross has been made real to us, that we are now commissioned to go and tell others. And you may say, Brother Snow, I don't know what to say. I can't do that. Do you know what? Jesus still speaks peace. You are commissioned. We can have peace in the commission. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to worry about what we're going to say. We just have to be obedient that I will go and I will share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And I will do it in peace because God has spoke peace to me. Praise God. And then now he comes, he has said peace to them twice when those certain number of disciples are gathered there. And now the disciples are gathered. Eight days later, he comes and Thomas is there and he speaks the word as well. And he says, peace be unto you. Now he has, he, he, he breathed upon them. Uh, he said, receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, he spoke that to them. Most commentators that I have read said that when he speaks peace, this third time, it's not about a piece of from being afraid. It's not a commissioning piece, but it is a sanctifying piece. Isn't it nice to know that when Christ has come into our life and He sanctifies us, it's an instantaneous but progressive work that there's peace in the sanctification that God brings. A real Christian, someone who does more than just say, I believe, but takes that belief to action and takes it to the cross and has the blood applied and the Spirit of God saves them, they begin a progress called sanctification. And no matter what anybody else says, the peace that God gives in sanctification can't be taken away. And as we continue to live a progressive sanctified life, there is peace in that. Now one of the most amazing things that I see, and John does this awesome display of presenting this to us. So he walks in the room, verse number 26, right? You all with me? You can look at the Word of God. Tell me if I'm right. Tell me if I'm wrong. He walks in the room. The disciples are there. Thomas is with them. And he says to them, Peace be unto you. Someone, yeah, I'm not going to read it. I want someone to read. What does he say in verse number 27? Then he says to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believe. Whoa. Whoa. Now, I have to tell you, studying helped me get a grasp of this. I mean, maybe my brain wouldn't have picked it up on its own. But I love this. So now, everybody knows what Thomas said to the disciples, right? Huh, not me. I ain't going to believe. Not until I touch in his hands. Not until I touch his No way. Not me. I'm not going to believe. Was Jesus there when he said that? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. But what does Jesus come in the room and what does he speak? Whoa! Whoa! Is that awesome or what? Is that great that God comes in the room and Jesus knows every one of Thomas's doubts? And even though Thomas uh, hadn't been in the room, uh, 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 John emphasizes this quality of God that God is a sovereign God. He knows all even before we even speak them. And so uh, Jesus didn't hear him audibly uh, in the room when he was speaking to the other disciples. I have doubt. And this is what has to happen for my doubt to be removed. But Jesus comes right in the room. Amen. He puts the cards on the table. Amen. And at this point, he addresses the needs. And, and he uses the very same words that Thomas used. The exact same words. Even though he didn't hear Thomas speak them. 
He is dealing with Thomas and showing him that I am a sovereign God. I know your anxieties. I know your fears. I know your doubts. I know your unspoken prayer requests. I know the contents of your mind and your heart. I know what you said when no one else I thought, I thought that I was listening. I know all about it. And Thomas, I'm here to address it. Now, I don't believe that Jesus came by to make Thomas look foolish or silly in front of the other disciples. That wasn't his intent. His intent was is that there is a need in Thomas's life, and I'm here to address it. Aren't you glad that God knows the needs in our life? And he would never be out to embarrass us. But he is out to address the needs that you and I have in our life. I may not have expressed them to you, Brother Justin. You may not have expressed them to me, but God knows them. And God knows how to address them. <coughs> and so, he talks to Thomas. And he addresses those needs. He said, be not faithless, but believing. Have faith. You know what? That is exactly what Thomas did. He had faith. And the Bible says, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So there's a few things that I'm going to address here as I look at this. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. So seeing was believing it in his eyes. It's the lowest form of faith when you see it, that you believe it. But the highest form of faith is this. He said, blessed are they who have not seen, and yet they have believed. That's you and I. The greatest blessing is even though that we have not seen, Yet we believe in Jesus Christ as God and Lord of our life, that He is God Almighty. Now let's look at a few things. Thomas is satisfied uh, with, with the resurrection. Listen, he's slow and he's backward, but now he believes. Amen. Sometimes we're a little slow and backward in our believing. Let's not be hard on Thomas. Sometimes he's a little slow and backward, but you and I can be too. But as we get there, amen, God takes, amen, our trust and our confidence and our believing. So let's turn to the book of Isaiah chapter number 9 because I think it's worthy to look at this. And, and, and Isaiah chapter number 9. Someone read that, Isaiah uh, 9, verse 6. No, verse, yeah, verse number 6 and verse number 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it, with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even then, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Alright. So in these scriptures, Isaiah makes reference to the child being a, a God. Uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Goes on down. The mighty God. Isaiah references him as God. And then verse number 7, the Bible says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. For the first time ever, the title was given to Jesus Christ. Well, something that has been prophetically written, even in Psalms, but we won't turn there, uh, it is written. Thomas says, uh, he, he turned and he said to him, he said, my Lord and my God. Never before has Jesus been called these titles together. But it is prophetically fit that Thomas calls him this. So he gives him the deity of being God. He's not just a man. He's not a man who, 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 who makes a move to be God. 
but he refers to him as the deity of being God. He's not just man, but he's God. He's Lord and he's God. Now let's look a little closer. What was Thomas saying? He was saying this. He said that he is Lord or he is Adonai. We've heard that term before. Lord means Adonai or it means this, that he is my foundation and he is my stay. So this Thomas who was once doubting, he said, he said, my Lord, my Adonai, you're my foundation and you're my stay. And he said, my Lord and my God, or my Elohim, he says, you are my prince and you are my judge is what he said. So there's depth to what he said. He says, you're my foundation. He says, you're my stay and you're the the Prince of Peace, and you, you're the, you're the long-awaited Messiah. You are the real deal. You are my judge. In faith, he reaches out, and he says this, and he makes this open profession that he is Lord and God, and he does it in front of those that he once made doubt unto. So now, Brother Craig, uh, all these other disciples that he was once doubting, now he makes a profession. Wait, my doubt is slipped away, and I make a profession. Doubt is gone, and I accept him as Lord and God. I think it's an example to us that even though we can be doubters, that there is a responsibility for those that maybe once we showed doubt and, 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 and a lack of faith, that there's a responsibility to go back and say, wait a second, I was wrong. My doubt is wrong. He is Lord and He is God. Amen. We've got to make a profession when we accept Him as Lord and God. And Thomas did that. Though he was slow and though he was weak in faith, Jesus accepts him as a believer. Wow. 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 What a testimony. How many uh, 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 Thomases do we have here? Maybe we were weak of faith. Maybe we're, we were slow in making the move. I think uh, uh, our, our humanity can make us that way. But it is an example that Christ accepts us even though we're slow of faith, even though we may be weak in faith. And Jesus, He commends him for his faith. And then uh, He says, uh, uh, even though you've seen, He said, uh, you, you believe. Uh, but what about those who have not seen? More blessing is upon them. What does Hebrews 11 one says? It says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But more blessed are those who haven't seen, but yet they believe. That is the foundation of faith. Praise God. Right. To me, I love, I, I, I just got I keep falling in love with this gospel job. I love his presentation of the deity of God, uh, of the, just the, the sovereignty of God. And, 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 and then, you know, verse number 30 and 31, the Bible says, uh, well, I think I... Uh, that's what, okay, no, I'm not in myself. We're okay. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. Who knows what all Jesus did? It's not even recorded. The Bible says, which are not written in this book. Now I know that means particularly John did not write everything, not all the miracles that Jesus did, John did not record in his book. I mean, we look at the Gospel of John and it's phenomenal. That believing you might, uh, okay, let me, I gotta help myself. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John doesn't write to give us the great number of miracles, but John's goal is to present to us that eternal life is given to us as we accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. When we believe by faith on Him and the work of the cross, amen, we may have eternal life. I love how John does that. It's not about the miracles. It's about faith in Jesus Christ. And the miracles are amazing and they're awesome. We're drawn to them. We like them. They encourage us. 
But John says, uh, it's not all about the miracles. It's about the relationship with Jesus Christ that gives eternal life. And he said that believing you might have a life through his name. Faith accepts the testimony of the scriptures that Jesus Christ is the Messiah officially. Realize that's what they were dealing with. All of the Jews were looking for a Messiah. They didn't accept him as a Messiah. They did as long as it was on their terms. Remember the whole triumphant, triumphant entry in Jerusalem? They accepted him because they thought he was coming to set up this political government. But when he didn't do it their way, nope, he can't be the Messiah. And so John gives validation that he is the Messiah. And that you may have eternal life if you believe upon him. Let's at least begin, because I want to share a few things that I think are noteworthy and important. In chapter number 21, the Bible says that after these things, Jesus did show himself again to the disciples. So he's going to appear to them again. He has, seems to be appearing to the believers, remember? Those are the ones that's trusting him and believing him and following him. There's something to be said about believers. Jesus shows up in their midst. The Bible says at the Sea of Tiberias, or what do we know it as? At the Sea of Galilee. That's correct. And uh, otherwise, he showed himself. He makes an appearance. And uh, we're going to see that he makes an appearance. And he seems to appear in various life situations. Or life problems. Don't you love how Jesus makes an appearance? And the various situations of life. So here was Thomas. He was a doubter. He showed up. He showed up to Mary Magdalene who was sorrowful and seeking. He showed up to the disciples who were fearful and happy. He shows up in various life situations. And so here it is. The Bible says they were together, together. Simon, Peter, and Thomas called. What was he called? Didymus. Does anyone know why it's called Didymus? There's two things. There's two things that can be. We probably know primarily the one. Hint, hint. They live in our house. Does anyone know? It means twin. So it could have been that Thomas was a twin. We don't know much about his brother. You, I mean. You know, we, we don't know, but it definitely means twin. However, it could also mean this, and I did not know this, or at least that I remember it, until I studied. It could also mean that a nickname was given to him by the other disciples or apostles. Any of you ever been given a nickname by someone? You know, whatever that nickname is because of who you are or characteristic about you. And it could have been that he looked like someone else. And so the disciples called him twin. Because he looked like someone else. Possibility, we don't know all those things. But I thought it was interesting food for thought. And so, I just threw that out there. <coughs> the Bible says that, that, that uh, and, and Nathaniel uh, of, of Canaan and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and Two other disciples, uh, and Simon uh, Peter, he said unto him, I go fishing. He said, let's go fishing. Now, you know how, for me, more in my past, I enjoyed going fishing just because it was fun. You know, really, I mean, like, sometimes I would go before work, and sometimes I would go after work, because I liked it. It was fun. You know, you catch fish. I know Brother Doug, we're just throwing in. You know, I know all about that, but I still like catching them. I like bringing them in. You know, it's something, especially fishing after the fish has been there for a while, it really makes you feel like you're a good fisherman with the craft when you can catch them when no one else can't. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I enjoy that. However, it wasn't that these men were enjoying fishing. They may have, 
But it was probably deeper than that. Two things while they were probably fishing. And number one is because they had needs and they had financial situations. And so it was a means of a financial income for them as they needed to provide for themselves and their families. And so the need is there and they are fishing and so um, uh, 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 that's what they're doing. The other thing is this. Their life has drastically changed. They have been taught by Jesus and traveling with Jesus and Jesus is gone. Or at least in the relationship that he was. Now I know he appeared to them and showed them. But Sister Stacy, he's not going with them ever. They're not traveling. He's not teaching them. He's not uh, teaching them all. The, the, the situation has changed. And the Holy Ghost has not descended in Acts chapter number 2 yet. So they are kind of in a place.